Hello, uh, now welcome back to this uh, series of lectures on uh, numerical optimization. So, in the last lecture, we uh, discussed about uh, uh, how to formulate a optimization or a mathematical programming problem, uh, and we also saw some ways to solve uh, some of those problems using graphical method. Uh, so, in this course, we will mainly you know worry about solving uh, uh, mathematical optimization problems using uh, either analytical methods or numerical methods. Now, uh, all these optimization methods will require some background, uh, some mathematical background on say, sets, uh, linear algebra, uh, differential calculus. So, uh, in the next one or two lectures, we will spend some time studying about some of the background needed. Uh, some, some of the mathematical background needed for this course. So, I will uh, uh, try to give some important results which will be used in this course uh, and for some details one can always refer to uh, some of the references given which will be given at the end of this uh, lecture. Okay, so, let us start with uh, some mathematical background. Uh, we will start with uh, the definition of sets uh, as a all of you know that a set is a collection of objects which satisfy certain property. So, for example, we can have a set of natural numbers which take the values uh, 1, 2, 3 and so on. One could have a set of real numbers or one could have uh, as mentioned here a set uh, whose elements are real numbers and the elements take the values in the range 1 to 3 both 1 and 3 inclusive okay so so this is the property that needs to be satisfied the by satisfied by the elements of the set now in this case the property is that uh, the elements have to be natural numbers so one can define a set using a certain property now there could be some cases where a, a set does not contain any object uh, such sets uh, are called empty sets and we will denote them by the letter now, let us look at some operations on uh, sets. So, suppose we consider two sets A and B, uh, which are part of some universal set U and uh, the union operation is defined like this, where uh, we take either element of X or element of B. So, this uh, the, the elements X which satisfy this property that, that will be denoted as A union B. Similarly, we have the intersection of two sets A and B denoted like A intersection B, uh, where the elements of the set ha have to belong to uh, both the sets. So, the intersection A of A and B is uh, the set of those elements which are both in A and B. Now, the difference uh, between A and B, uh, this also be, can be called A minus B, uh, sometimes denoted by slash backslash. <coughs> Uh, so, this uh, is the set of elements of X which uh, set of elements of A uh, which do not belong to B. So, if we collect all such elements of A which do not belong to B that will give us a difference between A and B. Now, we will show this uh, using some figures. So, let us consider uh, two sets A and B which are uh, part of the universal set U. Uh, so, uh, the set A consists of all the elements inside this circle, green circle and uh, the set B consists of all the elements which are inside this blue circle. So, these are the given sets A and B. Now, now let us look at the uh, union operation. So, the A union B is basically the set of all elements which either belong to A or belong to B. So, the shaded region here uh, tells you uh, that this is the union of uh, this is the union of two sets a and b now let us look at the intersection so intersection is uh, essentially those elements which are which belong to both a and b so you will see that the the shaded region here denotes the elements which are part of the set a as well as the part of set b so this is called the intersection now, if the intersection of two sets is empty, 
uh, we say that the sets are disjoint. So, for example, a set A is somewhere here and the set B is on the other side and they do not have anything in common, then uh, we say that uh, they are disjoint. And uh, for disjoint sets, we say that A intersection B is a null set. Now, let us look at the difference between A and B. So, the shaded region here denotes the, the elements of the set A which do not belong to the set B. So, this is called the difference between the set A and the set B. Similarly, if we want if we want to find out the difference between B and A, it will be the other part of the shaded region, the elements of B which are not part of A. So, this is called the difference between the sets A and B. Uh, and we will use backslash to denote that difference. Uh, so, suppose we have uh, A and B as two sets which are given like this. Now, we say that A is a subset of B that is every member of A is also a member of B and we write this as A subset of B. Now, if it so happens that there exist some elements in B which are not part of A. For example, some elements here are not part of A. So, if such a thing happens, then we say that uh, A is a strict subset of B. So, if A is a subset of B and if there exists some element Y which belongs to B such that Y does not belong to A, then we write A as a subset of B, a strict subset of B. So, the strict subset will be denoted by this symbol. Now, we look at the supremum and infimum of a set. Now, so let us consider a set of real numbers. Uh, now, that set, uh, uh, let us consider a subset of real numbers. Now, that set is said to be bounded above if there is a real number y such that every element of x of a is less than or equal to y. Uh, now, among all possible such y's, if we find the smallest possible real number such that x is less than or equal to y for every x in the set A, then it is called the least upper bound or supremum of A and is denoted by sup x such that x belongs to A. So, you will see that uh, uh, we first find the uh, any number y such that uh, x is less than or equal to y for all x belong to A. And then among all such y's, if we take the smallest possible real number y, such that this property holds that for every x belongs to A, uh, x less than or equal to y, then we get the supremum or the least upper bound of A. Now, uh, along similar lines, one can define what is called the greatest lower bound or infimum. So, in that case, one has to look for uh, the element y such that uh, x is greater than or equal to y for every x belongs to A. And among them, uh, if you find out the largest number such that x is greater than or equal to y for every x belongs to A, then it is called the greatest lower bound or infimum. Now, uh, here is an example. So, let us consider a case uh, set S, set A, where one is uh, uh, the elements of the set satisfy this property, where one is less than or equal to A x less than 3. Now, uh, so which means that we include 1 in the set, but we will not include 3 in the set, but any real number less than 3 is uh, uh, and greater than or equal to 1 is uh, permitted in the set. Now, if you take the supremum of this set, now any number greater than 3 is a upper bound for uh, this set, but then among all those numbers, what is the least upper bound and the least upper bound or supremum is 3 and you will note that this 3 does not belong to the set A. So, a supremum need not belong to the set ok and uh, similarly one can define the infimum of this set and it turns out that the infimum that is the greatest lower bound of this set is 1 and in this case it does belong to the set A. So, supremum and infimum uh, uh, they need not belong to the set, they can belong to the set, depends on the definition of the set. Okay. Now, uh, we move on to uh, the 
vector concept of vector space. So, we have so far studied the sets. So, some of those concepts could be useful uh, in studying the vector spaces. Now, uh, a non empty set S is called a vector space if it satisfies certain properties. So, let us look at uh, some of those properties uh, in detail. Now, for any two members x and y of the set S, uh, first of all, there is a uh, operation plus which is defined and uh, such that x plus y always uh, in, is in the set S. Now, further uh, the uh, this addition operation should be commutative. For example, x plus y should be equal to y plus x and also uh, it should be associative. For example, if you take y plus z and the resultant uh, element if it added to x, it is same as adding x and y first and then adding the uh, element z. So, this is called the associativity. So, uh, for any x y the addition operation is defined and is in the set S, uh, x plus y is in the set S and the commutativity and associativity holds. Now, further there should exist an element uh, in S which is called let, let us denote it by 0 such that x plus 0 is equal to 0 plus x for all x in the set S. So, this 0 is called the uh, identity for addition. So, that means, if you add that identity element to the uh, to any element x, you will get x. <coughs> Similarly, uh, there exists for any x uh, belong to the set S, there exists y such that x plus y is equal to 0. So, this y is called the additive inverse of x. So, the element when it, it is added with its additive inverse, you get the identity for the addition. Now, uh, for any x belongs to S and alpha is a set of real numbers, uh, alpha x should be defined and that should be also in the set S. And uh, one, this, this is a one, uh, one a, sc a scalar one uh, multiplied by x should give us x for every x. Okay, so this is called the multiplicative identity. So this is. Uh, uh, identity for the 0 is the identity for the addition operation and 1 is the identity for the multiplication operation. Now, uh, here I have mentioned alpha belongs to R. In fact, uh, for a vector space uh, alpha can come from any field, but uh, for this course we will be restricting ourselves only to the field of real numbers. So, that is why I have mentioned alpha to belong to R. Now, uh, for Further, for any x, y in the set S and alpha beta from the field of real numbers. Uh, so, alpha, uh, so if you find out x plus y and then multiplied by alpha, so it is same as finding alpha x plus alpha y. So, uh, multiplication distributes over addition and similarly, uh, alpha plus beta combined together multiplied by x is same as alpha x plus beta x. And uh, if you multiply a vector x by beta uh, and then uh, by alpha, it is same as good as mul multiplying alpha and beta together and then multiplying them by the uh, vector x. Okay. So, all these properties should hold where uh, uh, x, y are any two elements of the set S and alpha, beta, they come from the field of real numbers. Now, these elements of uh, the set S they are called the vectors. Okay. So, so the vector space is a space uh, formed using vector. Now, there are uh, some standard examples of vector spaces. For example, the space of real numbers, n dimensional space of real numbers, two dimensional space of real numbers. These are some standard examples of uh, vector spaces. Now, here are some notations that we will uh, use in this course. Of course, some of them I have already used, but uh, let me uh, specify them in detail. So, R denotes the vector space of uh, real numbers and R n is the vector space of real n dimensional vectors. So, uh, an n dimensional vector 
x can be written as a column vector consisting of n elements. Now, each of these elements is a real number. So, x belong to R n uh, means that each of the x sides belong to R and there are n such x sides i going from 1 to n. Now, the transpose of a vector will be denoted by a, a row vector. Okay, so, the vector will typically will we will denote the vector by a column vector and it is transposed by a row vector. Now, uh, there are some special cases where we have 0 vector. So, 0 vector is uh, a vector which con contains all zeros and uh, the vector 1 which contains all 1s. Sometimes we will use the letter E to denote this uh, 1 vector. Now, the number of elements here uh, depends on the uh, the situation. So, I have not specified exactly the number of elements uh, here. So, based on the context one can uh, decide wh what is the number of elements in the 0 and the 1 vector. Now, uh, if S and T are vector spaces such that S is a subset of T, then S is called a subspace of T. Okay. So, so, here is one question that what are the possible subspaces of R2? Now, if you look at the possible subspaces of R2, then the origin a, a subspace containing only the 0 vector is a sub, subspace of R2. Then R2 itself is a subspace of R2. And then uh, what we have is uh, the set of lines which pass through the origin. So, this is one line which passes through the origin. This is a vector space which is a uh, subspace of R2. Now, it is easy to characterize a subspace. Uh, you can think of it as a uh, space where uh, if suppose x, y are any two vectors in the vector space and alpha and beta uh, are any two real numbers coming from the field of uh, real numbers then alpha x plus beta y should always belong to the subspace. Now, going by this definition, you will realize that if we put uh, y equal to uh, minus x and alpha and beta to be 1, then uh, x minus x that is 0 should also belong to the subspace. So, a 0 vector should always belong to the subspace. So, sometimes uh, you know this is also called a linear uh, subspace. Now, if you translate this subspace, that is then it uh, no longer remains a subspace because the origin does not uh, lie in that. Such uh, spaces are called affine spaces. Okay, so, affine space is just a translation of uh, a linear subspace. Now, in R3, uh, if you want to write out write down the possible subspaces, so R3 itself is a subspace of R3, then uh, you have uh, 0 vector which is a trivial subspace of R3 and then the, the set of lines which pass through the origin form a subspace of R3 Then set of planes passing through the origin also form a subspace of R3. Now, each sub sp uh, vector space uh, is spanned by the set of vectors. So, let us look at now what is called the spanning set. So, a set of vectors x1 to xk is set to span the vector space S if any vector x belong to S can be represented as a linear combination of those vectors. So, so if you are given this set x1 to xk, then any vector in the vector space can be represented as a linear combination of those vectors, where these alphas are some real coefficients. So, such a set is said to be the spanning set of the vector set. Now, here is one example. So, we have <coughs> 5 vectors given here. So, a 1 which is 1 0, a 2 which is 1 1, then a 3 which is 0 1, a 4 minus 1 0 and a 5 1 minus 1. So, these are the 5 vectors in 2 dimensional space and they span the 
two dimensional two dimensional space of real numbers so what it means is that you take any vector uh, in the space of uh, uh, to uh, in the two dimensional space of real numbers now that vector can always be represent as a uh, represented as a linear combination of each of these vectors now that linear combination what we saw uh, it may so happen that we will not require all the vectors some of the alphas could be zero when we uh, specify a linear combination so for example if we take a2 a2 itself can be represented as a1 plus a3 and uh, we do not require a4 and a5 if we use a1 and a3 to represent a2 right so similarly one can work out uh, other examples of vectors which can be represented using any of these vectors now uh, obviously the next question would be that uh, uh, what is the minimum size of the spanning set that is needed to span a uh, given vector space so it is clear that if we are just given one vector say a1 right a1 you uh, cannot be used to represent any vector in the two dimensional space uh, on the other hand if we are given say a1 and a3 we can represent any vector in the two dimensional space so then then what is the role of a2 a4 a5 so so is there any redundancy in this set of vectors which span the space r2 so we have to study the notion of uh, linear independence for this purpose now a set of vectors x1 to xk is said to be linearly independent if the linear combination of those xi equal to 0 means that all, each of the real each of the coefficients alphas are at zero for all i going from 1 to k now if they are not linearly independent then they are said to be linearly dependent and one of them can be written as a linear combination of the others so this is the important definition for uh, uh, linear independence of vectors uh, so the linear combination of those vectors is zero implies that each of the real uh, coefficients alphas has to be zero so such a set of vectors is said to be linearly independent now if you look at uh, uh, the vectors a1 and a2 so this is 1 0 and this is 1 1 they are linearly independent so one can show that if uh, we take alpha 1 a1 plus alpha 2 a2 equal to 0 that will result in alpha 1 and alpha 2 to be 0 on the other hand if you take the vectors a1 and a4 so if a1 is 1 0 and a4 is minus 1 0 then they are linearly dependent so one can easily see that uh, a4 can be written as minus of a1 right so so a1 minus a4 is equal to uh, uh, a1 plus a4 is equal to 0 so and uh, this will happen when alpha 1 equal to 1 and alpha 2 is, uh, is equal to 1 so uh, sigma uh, so a1 plus a4 equal to 0 essentially means that uh, the, the two vectors are linearly dependent now <coughs> a set of vectors is said to be a basis for the vector space if they are linearly independent and span that, that set spans s so if you look at the previous example a1 and a2 are linearly independent and if a1 and a2 also span the space s that means that if suppose any vector x in the two dimensional space can be written as a linear combination of a1 and a2 then a1 and a2 turns out to be a basis for the space so you will see that uh, a1 and a2 form a basis similarly a1 and a3 also form a basis so this shows that the bases are not unique so i can have a1 a2 as a, a basis or a1 a3 as a basis or a4 a3 also as a basis or a2 a5 as a basis and so on or a2 a3 as a basis okay so the only thing that i have to ensure is that they are linearly independent and those vectors 
should span the space S. So as we saw that uh, a vector space need not have a unique basis, one can have multiple basis. But suppose if we fix a basis say x1 to xk for a, a vector space S, then any x in that space S is uniquely represented using x1 to xk. So, once you fix a basis, a vector is always uniquely represented. So, the alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha, alpha k will be unique representation of x with respect to the basis x1 to xk. Now, if you take any two bases of a vector space, they have the same cardinality. So, the number of bases uh, could be same, they should be same for a given vector space and dimensional uh, dimension of a vector space is the cardinality of a basis. So, the set of linearly independent vectors is maximum linearly independent vectors which span the set S that is the basis and then uh, the cardinality of that set is called the dimension. Now, uh, when we looked at the example in the two dimensional space, we saw that a1 and a2 or a1 and a3 are enough to represent uh, any vector in the two dimensional space and further a1 and a2 or a1 and a3 are linearly independent. So, they form a basis. So, so the dimensionality of this space is 2 because I can form a uh, basis of size 2. Similarly, uh, extending those ideas to high dimensional spaces, we can, we can say that the dimension of the vector space R n is n. Now, if E i denotes an n dimensional vector whose ith element is 1 and the remaining elements are zeros, then the set E 1 to E 1 to E n, it forms a standard basis for R n. So, in each of these E i's, the ith element is 1 and the rest of the elements are 0. So, they form a standard basis. So, if you look at the two dimensional example, this a1 and a3, they form a standard basis of R2. Now, a basis for a vector set S is a maximal independent set of vectors which spans the space S. So, it is a maximal independent set which spans uh, the set. So, if you add anything, any extra vector to this uh, basis, then it becomes a, uh, a set of linearly dependent vectors. Okay. So, uh, adding any extra thing uh, to the set S will make it linearly independent. And uh, uh, one more remark about this basis is that a basis for the vector space S is a minimal spanning set of vectors which spans the space S. So, this is the minimal spanning set. So, if you take out any element from the set S, uh, the vector space cannot be, uh, any element of the vector space S cannot be constructed using the remaining element. So, these are necessary elements uh, to span the uh, space S. So, these are two important concepts that the it is a maximal independent uh, set of vectors which spans S and the minimal spanning set. So, you cannot add anything because then it will become dependent and you cannot remove anything from that set of basis because then it will not span the space S. Now, after having studied this uh, vectors uh, and vector spaces, we look at uh, some other uh, uh, preliminaries. Uh, so, let us look at the functions. Now, a function f is always defined from a set A to B uh, so, and the function assigns each element in X in A a unique, unique element F X in B. So, we will denote this as F is a function where it takes an element from the set A and assigns it uh, an element F of X in B and uh, F from A to B is denoted like this. Now, uh, we call this A as the domain of F. Now, so the function takes an element of A 
and assigns it some value. So, the values taken by the function in the set B that is called the range of F. So, uh, remember that the range of F is always a subset of the set B. So, here are some examples of the functions. Uh, so, say suppose F is defined from R to R. So, the domain as well as the range are the set of real numbers and the function is defined as f of x equal to x square. So, uh, this function will take every x, uh, every element of from the domain and assign a value x square to it and that will be the function value. One can also define a function say from the uh, open interval minus 1 to 1 to r uh, where the function is defined as 1 over mod x minus 1. So, this uh, you can see that this function is not defined at the end points of this uh, interval while it is defined at any intermediate points. So, this is the definition of a function. So, we now define uh, uh, what is called a norm on Rn. So, a norm on Rn is a real valued function. So, it takes a n dimensional vector and assigns a real number to it and then it satisfies certain properties. So, the first property that the norm should satisfy is that a norm is always non-negative. So, you take any vector x in Rn, the norm has always to be non-negative and norm is 0 if and only if x is a 0 vector. So, for only for 0 vectors the norm is 0 otherwise uh, it is a positive quantity. Now, if you take uh, a vector x belong to Rn and alpha a real number, then the norm of al alpha x can be written as mod alpha into norm x. Now, we have seen that uh, norm x is always a non-negative quantity and uh, norm also has to be a negative quantity. So, this uh, we have to take mod alpha here. So, mod alpha is always a uh, non-negative quantity. So, this holds for every x in Rn and alpha belongs to R. Uh, the third important property that the norm should satisfy is that norm of x plus y should be less than or equal to norm x plus norm y uh, for every x and y in Rn. Now, this property is called uh, triangle inequality and it is clear from this figure. So, we have a vector x. So, norm x is uh, the length of this vector we have vector y, norm y is the length of this vector. Now, suppose if we add x plus y, so the resultant vector is x plus y and its length is norm of x plus y. Now, this vector is y. So, using triangle inequality that uh, we have studied in earlier classes, we know that the, uh, the side of a tri triangle is always less than or equal to the sum of the sides of some of the other two sides of that triangle. So, norm of x plus y is always less than or equal to norm x plus norm y. So, <coughs> so a norm should always satisfy these properties. Uh, we will we'll see more details about these norms uh, now. Okay, so, let x be a vector in n-dimensional space. Now, here are some definitions of some popular norms. So, one is called the L2 or Euclidean norm. Uh, we uh, know about this norm. So, norm x, uh, so L2 norm of x. So, you take a square of each element, add them and then uh, take a square root. So, this is called the L2 norm of the vector x. The L1 norm, uh, you take an absolute value of each of the elements and then sum them up that will give us the L1 norm of x. So, there is another norm uh, which is sometimes used that is called the L infinity norm where we among all possible values we take maximum of mod x i and that will be the uh, infinity norm of the vector x. So, I will give some illustration about uh, some of these norms. So, let us take a two dimensional space. So, you have uh, two axes here and uh, there is a vector uh, origin here and the uh, vector x 
which has two components x1 and x2. So, uh, so the norm of x is easy to find. So, so this distance, so if you drop a perpendicular from x to this horizontal axis, okay, so this distance is x1. So, from 0 to this point, the distance is x1 and from this point to this, the distance is x2, which is as good as saying that we drop a perpendicular from x to the vertical axis. So, this distance is x2. So, the horizontal distance is x1, the vertical distance is x2. So, norm x is square root of x1 square plus x2 square using Pythagoras theorem. So, that we have shown here. So, this is a uh, illustration of a L2 norm. Now, uh, we will look at some sets. Uh, so, suppose uh, we uh, again consider a two dimensional space of real numbers. Now, uh, the set is shown here is a set of points whose two norm is less than or equal to r. So, the points on this circle as well as the points in the interior of the circle, they constitute the set S where the two norm of uh, x is less than or equal to r. Now, the two norm x is uh, less than or equal to r means that we are talking about a circle of radius r centered around origin. Now, when it comes to one norm, uh, the things are different. So, you will see that uh, uh, again we consider a two dimensional space of real numbers and the, the region shown here is the set of points whose one norm is less than or equal to 1. So, you will see that uh, unlike the previous case, this is a you know diamond shaped object uh, centered around origin. Now, if we look at the L infinity norm, so this is a square whose endpoints are 1, 1 and minus 1, minus 1. Uh, so, the shaded region or the colored region here shows that uh, the set of all points whose uh, L infinity norm is less than or equal to 1. So, you will see that uh, depending upon the definition of the norm, the distance measure has a different notion. Uh, okay. So, in general, uh, we can define a LP norm where P is a finite quantity greater than or equal to 1. Uh, so, we can define LP norm as uh, you take the mod of the individual component and uh, take a uh, pth power of that, sum them up over all the n components of the vector and then take a pth root of that quantity. So, we have studied so many different types of norms and different norms exist uh, uh, as we see here. Now, the question is that uh, uh, typically in uh, optimization algorithms, we use some norm uh, to find out the distance of a current point from the solution. So, the obvious question that one would ask is that does the convergence of a particular optimization algorithm depend on which norm is used for uh, as a stopping criteria. Uh, so, there is an important result which holds in uh, Rn, not in infinite dimensional space. So, <coughs> we say that if suppose you have two norms, norm P and norm Q, which are defined on Rn, then there exist uh, positive constants alpha and beta such that alpha no, uh, p -th norm of x is less than or equal to q -th norm of x less than or equal to beta p -th norm of x for any x in Rn. So, which means that the if we consider q -th norm that is bounded below and above by the uh, p -th norm of the same vector with appropriate constants alpha and beta. So, uh, the result of an optimization algorithm does not depend on the norm that you use. Uh, in your stopping criteria because of this important result. So, when we now look at uh, 
some other definitions. Uh, so, the first one is uh, the inner product of uh, two vectors. So, let us consider two non-zero vectors in uh, n dimensional space, then the inner product or dot product of these two vectors. So, we will denote either by x dot y or x transpose y. So, we can we will use either of these notations when we refer to the inner product of x and y and that is defined as take the uh, product of the individual components uh, of the two vectors and then sum them up. So, component wise product of the two vectors and then uh, summing up of those products will give us the inner product of two vectors x and y and uh, that can be also written as 2 norm of x into 2 norm of y into cos theta where theta is the angle between uh, the two vectors x and y. So, this is how the inner product or dot product of two vectors is defined. Now, there are some remarks that I would like to make here. Uh, first one is that x transpose is x is nothing but norm x square. So, that is obvious from this definition that uh, when you take a dot product of the vector with, res with respect to itself, then the angle between the two vectors is 0, cos 0 is 1. So, x transpose x is nothing but norm x square. Similarly, uh, the angle between x and y is same as the angle between y and x. So, x transpose y is nothing but y transpose x. Now, there is another important property that uh, uh, one should keep in mind is the mod of x dot y is less than or equal to norm x and into norm y. This is called Cauchy Schwartz uh, inequality. Uh, <coughs> so, this property is obvious from the definition of uh, the inner product. Now, we know that cos theta is always in the range minus 1 to 1. So, mod of x dot y has to be less than or equal to norm x into norm y. So, this is called Cauchy Schwartz inequality. We will use it uh, sometime uh, during this course. The next concept is about the orthogonality of uh, vectors. Now, suppose x and y are perpendicular to each other. Uh, so, here is a vector x and here is a vector y which are perpendicular to each other. Now, I have taken a vector which is x minus y. So, if you take y plus x minus y, you get x. Now, since the two vectors are perpendicular, we can use Pythagoras formula. So, norm x square plus norm y square is equal to norm of x minus y square. Now, if you expand the right side, what we get is norm x square plus norm y square minus 2 into x transpose y. Now, equating these two, you will see that x transpose y has to be 0. So, which means that if x and y are perpendicular to each other, then x transpose y has to be 0. So, here is a definition of orthogonality. So, let x be a n dimensional vector, y also be a n dimensional vector. Uh, x and y are said to be orthogonal or perpendicular uh, to each other if x transpose y equal to 0. So, we will use the term perpendicular or orthogonal uh, uh, interchangeably. Now, suppose if you have two subspaces S and T which are of the same vector space R n. The two subspaces are said to be orthogonal if every vector x belong to S is orthogonal to every vector y belong to T. So, that means that if you take any x in S and any y in T, then x transpose y equal to 0. Uh, so, suppose if you take uh, a two dimensional space and we take a uh, horizontal axis as a one space, a one uh, subspace and the vertical axis as another subspace. Now, clearly they are subspaces because they pass through the origin. Now, you will see that any vector x uh, in, on the horizontal axis is perpendicular to any vector y on the vertical axis. So, uh, such subspaces are called orthogonal sub. Uh, subspaces are said to be orthogonal to each other.
Now, let us look at the definition of orthogonal complement. Now, suppose given a space S, the space of all vectors orthogonal to S is called the orthogonal complement of S. So, suppose if I take a three dimensional space, now S is suppose a, a space spanned by the vectors x1 and x2. So, you can think of it as a horizontal plane and T is the subspace uh, spanned by the third axis which is x3. Now, these two, uh, so any vector in the uh, space S is orthogonal to any vector in the space T. Now, further S and T together span the three dimensional space. So, there is a difference between the orthogonal subspaces and orthogonal complements. So, in orthogonal complement, the two subspaces span the entire, uh, the, in, the, in this case the two subspaces S and T span the three dimensional space. On the other hand, if we just take uh, uh, x1 as one subspace and uh, x3 as another subspace, then they do not, uh, although the, uh, each vector on x1 is orthogonal to each vector on x3, they together do not span R3. Okay, so, they, they are just orthogonal to each other, but in this case since S and T together span uh, a three dimensional space, uh, we say that S and T are orthogonal complements of each other. Now, let us look at uh, mutual orthogonality. Now, vectors x1 to xk are said to be mutually orthogonal if uh, they are pairwise orthogonal. So, you take any two vectors, uh, two different vectors, their dot product is 0. Now, if further, if the norm of each vector is 1 for every i, then the set x1 to xk is said to be orthonormal. So, for the orthonormal set, xi transpose xj i not equal to j is equal to 0 and xi transpose xi equal to 1. Now, the next question is that is the set of mutually orthogonal vectors linearly independent? So, you have a, a, a vector space uh, whose basis is the horizontal axis and the vertical axis. So, we are talking about a two dimensional vector space. Now, these two uh, basis vectors are mutually orthogonal. Assume that uh, the norm of uh, each of the vectors is 1. Now, is this set of mutually orthogonal vectors linearly independent? And the answer is yes. Uh, if you have a set of uh, mutually orthogonal non-zero vectors, then they are indeed linearly independent. <laughs> so, uh, we will show this result. Now, to show this result, what we need to show is that the set of vectors are uh, linearly independent. So, which means that uh, sigma alpha x i equal to 0 implies alpha equal to 0 for all i. Now, here is, here is a uh, small proof of this result. Uh, so, let us start with uh, the left hand side. So, which says that uh, alpha 1 x 1 plus alpha 2 x 2 plus alpha k x k equal to 0 and finally, we have to show that the right side holds. Now, what we do is that we take a dot product of each of the vectors uh, with respect to x 1. Now, remember that uh, what is given is that x 1 to x k are mutually orthogonal non-zero vectors. So, we can expand this to write it as alpha 1 x 1 transpose x 1 plus alpha 2 x 2 transpose x 1 and so on plus alpha k x k transpose x, x 1 equal to 0. So, which can be shortly written uh, in the short form can be written as 
alpha sigma alpha a x i transpose x 1 equal to 0. Now, we are given that uh, the set of vectors are mutually orthogonal. So, x 1 trans, uh, transpose x 2 equal to 0, x 1 transpose x k equal to 0 except x 1 transpose x 1 and x 1 transpose x 1 is 1 because they are orthogonal. So, which so each of these uh, k minus 1 terms vanishes and what we are left with is only uh, alpha 1 x 1 transpose x 1 equal to 0 and since x 1 uh, has a norm 1 the only way this is possible is when alpha alpha 1 equal to 0. Now, similarly we can show that each of the alpha k is 0 by multiplying by x 2 to x k. So, by doing that we will show that all alpha all alphas are 0 and since all alphas are 0 this condition is satisfied and then we can say that the mutually orthogonal vectors are linearly independent. Now, uh, suppose x 1 and x 2 are uh, orthonormal. So, which means that uh, uh, they are perpendicular to each other and each of them has a unit norm. Now, if you take any vector x, we can write it as uh, the component of x along x 1 into the vector x 1 plus the component of x along x 2 into the vector x 2. So, the component of x along x 1 is x transpose x 1 and this direction is x 1. Similarly, the component of x along x 2 is x transpose x 2 and this direction is x 2. So, x can be written as x transpose x 1 into x 1 plus x transpose x 2 into x 2. Now, uh, this is a simple form in which x can be written. So, that uh, uh, this is a, it can be written as a linear combination of uh, x 1 and x 2 and uh, the individual components also can be found out easily. Now, all this requires that uh, x 1 and x 2 need to be orthonormal. Only then you know, we can write this in a uh, easy way. Now, what happens when uh, the set of vectors, the set of basis which is given to us uh, is not orthogonal. So, how to generate and uh, orthogonal basis, orthonormal basis from the set x 1 to x 2. So, here you will see that uh, unlike the previous case where x 1 and x 2 are orthonormal, here they are not orthonormal. So, they are not perpendicular to each other and neither they are perpendicular to each other nor they have unit norm. Now, from this uh, we are interested in uh, generating a basis which is orthonormal and uh, that basis I have shown here. So, which is y 1 and y 2. Uh, so, there are two important things that you have to note here. So, one is that uh, y 1 and y 2 which are generated using x 1 and x 2 they are orthonormal to each other, uh, they are orthogonal to each other and not only that. Uh, y 1 and y 2 they have unit norm. So, which means that they form an orthonormal basis for a, a space which is spanned by x 1 to x 2. Now, in general suppose you are uh, given n basis x 1 to x n, how do we form a orthonormal basis y 1 to y n such that y 1 to y n are mutually orthogonal and each of the y's have unit norm and that procedure is uh, commonly known as the gram schmidt procedure. So, we will study that procedure uh, next time, uh, but before I sign off uh, I just would like to uh, stress an important fact here is that uh, uh, this ortho or finding this orthonormal basis is a very important uh, in, in some of the optimization algorithms, uh, especially when we try to optimize along uh, each dimension and we, uh, 
when we optimize along one dimension uh, optimize an objective function along one dimension we want to uh, make sure that the next dimension that we add is orthonormal to the first one so finding the orthonormal basis uh, is a very important concept from the optimization viewpoint and uh, uh, we'll study that in the next class thank you